Uh, but I first particularly want to thank my group, um, without whom none of this research would be possible, and they, they're a constant source of inspiration to me. Uh, I'm very privileged to be able to work with a great bunch of people, uh, some of whom are here today and will be presenting. So thank you very much uh, to, to everyone. Uh, so I'm, uh, I, I, I'm doing Pablo a favor here by show <laughs> showing the slide uh, he missed out. But I, I show this uh, for a reason. I think one of them is to celebrate um, where Halo Perovskites have come over the last decade. Uh, and I'm going to start my talk actually sort of around this point here in 2012 when we saw the first uh, really big jump towards 10% efficiency and talk about some of the carrier recombination that we've been learning uh, at that time and, and since then. <clears throat> and so we've seen this, you know, this trajectory is very, very exciting. And it's something that I think um, you show a similar thing for organics. You actually see very, something very similar over the last few years as well, which is fantastic. So it's something very good for, uh, for emerging PV technologies that they are really starting to, to push towards, uh, to, to, well, towards commercialization and also towards really um, exciting efficiencies. But of course, this isn't entirely true. This isn't across all band gaps. Um, we're seeing this for some of the optimized band gaps, but um, not, for example, those um, needed for tandems, and that's something. So there is still work to be done in terms of efficiency to get uh, these up further. Um, the other sides of the coin, of course, is reliability and stability. And again, this has been very promising over the last two to three years. We've seen with, with uh, new alloy compositions or stabilized uh, compositions, we're seeing very, very good stabilities. Uh, and so th these are just a few snapshots of, uh, of, of recent work showing some very exciting uh, stabilities where uh, cells are stressed under very high elevated temperature or elevated stress conditions for many thousands of hours. Um, this is an example here of, of 2,000 hours. Uh, there's, there's a 9,000 hour demonstration here, so I don't think this laser point is that effective, but you can uh, maybe I'll, I'll direct on the screen. Uh, and then some mini modules as well. So this is some work from Jin Song Huang seeing uh, 30 centimeter square mini modules also being very stable. So this is, uh, this is very good. There's, even in the last few months, there's been some very good um, uh, damp heat stable, stabilized uh, devices shown as well. So we're seeing uh, it's not just efficiency. Now there is um, very good promise in the stability, uh, but there's still a long way to go. We're not, they're clearly not yet at the multi-year or even decade level. Uh, there's still a long way to go, particularly, again, when we think about other band gaps and, and those needed for, for, for tandems, for example. So this is what I'll talk about today uh, in, in this talk. I'm going to start with carrier recombination and, and some of the historical context of what we learned uh, and what we're still learning, particularly as, as the materials evolve as well. Uh, and then zooming in on, on the micro scale and the nano scale, looking at on the very small scales of what, um, how this recombination uh, appears and how it also affects stability. So I'll show, move into some of the, the work about how, how these, uh, how carrier traps actually end up seeding instabilities. Uh, and then some work on how the fundamental structure actually relates to, to stabilizing uh, these materials. And finally, talk about some uh, device work at the end. Uh, so just to start with carrier recombination, so luminescence is a very, very good probe for understanding semiconductor behavior. Uh, when we think about if we energize a semiconductor, we excite electrons, then eventually those, they'll uh, relax down to the, to the ground state and emit light. And so we can detect that light and we can use that as a probe to uh, understand the material, so understand both how long that carrier lives and also how, uh, how many traps, for example, uh, or what the traps are in the sample. And that's because if we look at, if we have a, another situation where we have, uh, we have non-radiative recombination, we have carrier traps, that, that's where these electrons uh, interact with these traps and end up losing their energy to heat, uh, then we don't have light emitted. So that, this allows us to, to see light as a very good probe for uh, understanding performance. Uh, and there's a fundamental link there, and it, it actually means that we need to actually make our solar cells very luminescent, uh, and a good solar cell should also be a good LED. If we run the solar cell uh, as an LED, injecting um, carriers in, we should get lots of light out. Uh, and so some of the measurements I'm going to show will, uh, will, will relate to luminescence and how luminescence uh, impacts. Oops. Uh, so I'm going I'm to go back almost 10 years now. So this, these are uh, what I believe is some of the first uh, time-resolved photoluminescence measurements of halide perovskite films. And these are methylamine and iodide films. They were grown with some chloride precursors as well, although the, the perovskite it forms is, is pure MAPI. Uh, and it was really, this is in October 2012, it was when we first measured these, it was a really, very much a wow moment that these, uh, these films have carry lifetimes that are on the order of, of tens or hundreds of nanoseconds. 
it was a very a big surprise at the time. We we're processing them very crudely. We we're expecting sort of nanosecond or, 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 or faster lifetimes, for example. Uh, so this was, a, a, I think, at least for me, one, one of the first wow moments about these materials. And the reason is, is because we can use, uh, because they've got long carry lifetimes, it means generally carriers can actually travel quite far. Uh, and so if we, get, we look at, uh, this is looking at um, luminescence quenching to understand carrier diffusion in these materials. So here, this is, we photoexcite the sample and we, we generate electrons and holes and they'll eventually recombine and emit lights so we can, if we optically excite with a pulse of light, we can then look at the, the light coming out over time. So this is a, a time-resolved PL decay here, uh, which is here sort of a few hundred nanosecond lifetime. Uh, and we can do another experiment where we put a, a, either a hole or an electron selective quencher on top, which will um, extract carriers when they hit that interface, uh, and that will quench the luminescence. So we, we can see, uh, yeah, okay, this <laughs> not working very well. So in the blue and red uh, curve there on the left, uh, you can see a quenched luminescence. Uh, and what we can do is we can model that with a diffusion equation, a relatively simple equation, actually, where we can globally model this. And the difference is that we have uh, a boundary condition when we have this quencher that the um, carriers, when they hit the interface, would, will, will be lost to the system. Uh, and so by doing that, we, we can extract a diffusion coefficient and uh, from that a diffusion length. And, and again, um, here this is a, a surprising result that the diffusion length of the carriers in these materials are on the order of microns, or at least over a micron at the time, and since they've actually been shown to, with, with newer compositions to be even longer. Uh, and this is important because when you look at, think about the absorption depth of these samples, so if we excite through the glass, um, the absorption depth is typically around 100 nanometers. So it means that because the carriers can travel a micron, they can easily traverse the, the, the full thickness of the absorber layer uh, to be collected at the opposite electrode. And so this means that we can use them in, rather than as a dye or rather than as a, as a, as a sensitizer, you can use them as a, as a thin film absorber sandwiched between electrodes and uh, as a planar heterojunction. Uh, and so we could we model this uh, recombination in more depth, so a useful Measurement is to look at uh, um, injection, uh, so changing the carrier excitation density. So these are some measurements looking at PL decays at different excitation densities. Uh, and you can see at low carrier density, we have uh, a monomolecular recombination. So this is a, uh, a first order process. So the, so the rate is, is first order. Uh, it's an exponential decay at, this is a particularly at low carrier densities where, where traps are dominating and, and it's trap limited. Uh, but as we go up to higher carrier densities, we um, we fill these traps, and you can see the, the recombination comes bimolecular and, and second order. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about that uh, in a few moments. Uh, <clears throat> but from this model, that means we can, we can extract trap densities as well. So we can globally model this and, and, and extract trap densities, for example. And, and at the time, this is in 2013, 2014, the, the, the trap densities were on the order of 10 to the 16 per centimeter cubed, uh, which is relatively low if we think about other solution process semiconductors. Uh, comparable to CIGS, for example, but much, much higher than uh, gallium arsenide or silicon, where defect densities are typically uh, five or six orders of magnitude lower. So this, this in some ways speaks to this defect tolerance that they we do have very high uh, trap densities, but, uh, but they're not so problematic. Uh, since this time, the, carry, the trap densities have come down to, with passivation and other, uh, other improvements in film processing are now sort of are on the order of 10 to the 15, maybe 10 to the 14 per centimeter cubed in the best thin films, uh, but lower in single crystals. Uh, and more recently, we've been looking at, uh, so if we, we, we can model the, um, the carry recombination with first order, second order, third order terms, and recently we've been looking at uh, how we can extract these rate constants, because they're important for understanding the, the film, but also predicting efficiency, for example, because we can use it to pr predict radiative efficiency. Uh, and so typically to, to get these, we'd usually have to do something like transient absorption measurements, which are typically quite uh, time and uh, equipment intensive. Uh, recently, Alan's been developing some work uh, to extract these just from fluence dependent PL quantum efficiency measurements. So purely from a measurement of uh, the, the photoluminescence quantum efficiency as a function of incident intensity. Uh, I'm not gonna show the mass here behind it, but you can essentially from this, we can actually uh, fit that and extract the ratios of the different recombination constants. So we don't get the absolute values, the ratios, uh, and, and here, so we've got A, B, and C, and then we've also got, uh, when we factor in, uh, escape probability of the, of, of, uh, of the photons as well, uh, we can have the radiative component, which is actually the uh, escape probability times the radiative recombination uh, coefficient. Uh, but we can then 
uh, <coughs> with a single time resolved PL measurement, so this is just a TLPL measurement at low fluence, we can then actually fix and, and extract the, the absolute recombination constants. So with a combination of PLQE and TLPL, you can get all of the recombination constants. Uh, and this, uh, this is an example of looking at the second order recombination constant we extract and comparing it to transient absorption. And you can see really quite good agreement. Uh, so I'd encourage you to have, have a look at this and see. We would welcome feedback on this and, and because a lot of these techniques are much more accessible to, to, to many labs. Uh, so that was mostly talking about methyl ammonium lead iodide. Uh, this is now thinking about alloying the systems and looking at adding formamidinium in and other things like bromide. Uh, what we see is that the recombination changes quite a bit. Uh, so this is looking at, again, PL decays, the function of time, uh, and looking first at, and this is with ex different excitation densities, looking first at methyl ammonium lead iodide in green. <coughs> as soon as we add some formamidinium, so this is something like 40% uh, formamidinium, you can see a, a, a huge increase in the carrier lifetime um, across all fluences. Uh, so you see this initial component and then this really long live, almost plateau type uh, decay. And if we look at that in more depth, if we look at, the, an, at time zero, what this looks like. So at time zero, we see that the recombination is second order, which is what we expect for, for electrons and holes recombining radiatively. But over time, as we get to this plateau here, uh, we see that after 200 nanoseconds, for example, oops, okay, uh, we see in the inset there at 200 nanoseconds, we see that the radiative recombination becomes quasi first order. Uh, and, and that's because what we're seeing is that w this radiative term here, we're seeing one of the carriers is, is in vast excess compared to the other carrier, so that this effectively becomes a quasi-first order term. Um, and this is a photodoping effect. What we see over time, we have an accumulation of one carrier. Actually, in this case, it's, it's photoexcited holes, <coughs> and so the recombination looks first order. Um, we can also see that if we look at the, the photoluminescence as a function of carrier density with different systems. Uh, this is methyl ammonium lead iodide here. Uh, which is second order the whole way through. It, we don't see this photodoping effect, and that's what we would expect. Uh, but when we, when we have, so the MA here has actually got a fraction of bromide. Uh, this is FA with some bromide and also some rubidium samples, for example. You can see all of these have, a, have this pseudo first order radiative component uh, after, after some time. So we're seeing this photodoping effect. And I'm going to, towards the end of the talk, um, bring this back up when we start looking at and visualizing this on the smaller length scales. <coughs> okay, so moving into to, to the microscope work. Uh, so this is, um, I think, this is the sort of, for me at least, the, the second wow moment, seeing the first photoluminescence maps when we look at the luminescence in the microscope. Um, this is some work actually that uh, David Ginger's group uh, led, we, we collaborated with them, and, and his student at the time, Dane de visited uh, Henry's group, and we started looking at these films and uh, really saw lots of heterogeneity in the luminescence maps. So this is around 2014 and 2015. Uh, this is an example here where we see, uh, this is actually overlaid over an SEM image, so you can see um, at least the morphological grains. And you can see some grains are really dark and, and poorly luminescent, and this is uh, typically well, it's attributed to, to, to traps and to defects, and I'll get on to that in a few moments. Uh, well, there's other regions on the sample are nice and radiative and, and very emissive. And of course, what we want is, is a uniformly bright image here. Um, I, I'm not going to show you so much of it today, but we're starting to now do these on full devices and actually operate them and, and extract pseudo-JV curves, for example, from uh, the optical measurements, which is actually a very powerful, uh, a, a powerful technique. Uh, we've been looking at them with, this is a textured tandem, uh, textured silicon tandem, and looking at the perovskite emission, we again see lots of heterogeneity, and it's not surprising when, with the texture there, it's, it's exacerbated this variation, and in fact the texture starts to really dominate some of this, although you can still see the underlying heterogeneity uh, within it. Uh, and so we've, we also see this, so that was in thin films, this is actually looking at sort of microcrystals, and looking at these are methyl ammonium lead bromide microcrystals, I think I might need someone to, to click this, because I'm not sure the movie will start. I don't know if, can someone over there? <laughs> there we go. So this is uh, using um, two-photon uh, two photon photoluminescence. We can actually do a 3D image of the luminescence. So these are microcrystals and the time snapshots of the PL decay over time. That should, yeah. So you can see this is a 30 nanosecond snapshot, and you see Already there's lots of heterogeneity in, this, in these 3D crystals. So this is 
um, not just in thin films, we're also seeing in nominal um, what are individual single crystallites. We're seeing lots of variation. Again, pockets where there's still long lived recombination, and other pockets where there's, uh, where, the, where there's not much, uh, where a lot of the luminescence has already decayed. Uh, so again, this heterogeneity kind of spans across different sample types. Oops, there we go. Uh, and we also see it in electron micro microscope images. So this is looking at, uh, on the long range, uh, the, these wavy patterns typically can be removed with, with optimizing the sample. But when we zoom in on these, you do see lots of grain to grain variation. And in fact, when you zoom in further uh, and, and look at the, the crystal structure of these, you actually see that these, what look like, what look like morphological grains are actually made up of smaller crystallites in typical samples, and, uh, and, and there's lots of very interesting subgrain features uh, that we're starting to understand, but it's quite a complex uh, landscape. Uh, so this all, all raises the question of how do they work so well in spite of this heterogeneity, and, and is this heterogeneity benign? So I'm going to talk um, for a few moments about these, these topics. Uh, <clears throat> so first of all, this is... Um, some work we did with uh, the group at CSIRO, Greg Wilson's group uh, and group at MIT, looking at strain in these materials and looking at trying to correlate photoluminescence maps with uh, s local structural maps, so looking at micro X-ray diffraction, for example. Uh, so this is some work, so this is taking a PL map, looking at the carry lifetime locally, so we see some regions that are, that are poorly emissive and have a fast carry lifetime, and other regions that have very long, uh, long, carry uh, long luminescence lifetimes. And if we correlate that with with the local structures in the top right there, you can see actually that the dark luminescent grains are slightly shifted in Q, so this is actually a lattice contraction with respect to the, to the brighter grains. And in fact, if we, if we look at a, a correlation between these, we see that there's a very strong anti, uh, correlation between the, the carry lifetime and strain, so where we have longer carry lifetimes where it's less strained and, uh, and shorter carry lifetimes where it's more strained. So this is the first hint that at least strain may well be playing a role in this uh, and so n this is some now turning some work at, um, this is working with Keshev Dani's group in Okinawa, looking at photo emission microscopy. So here, this is uh, a technique where we come in with a UV probe and we uh, liberate, we photo emit electrons. They can either be electrons in, in bound trap states or in the valence band. And because of we can energy resolve these electrons, uh, <coughs> uh, we, can, we can know how deep they're bound in the semiconductor whether they're traps, for example, or, or valence band electrons. Uh, and because it's in a microscope, we can also spatially resolve where these electrons are coming from. Uh, and this is a typical photo emission spectra here. So this is the valence band edge. And uh, you can see some regions on the sample have lots of trap states and, and lots of subgap uh, features, whereas other regions on the sample are quite clean in the subgap region. Uh, and we can effectively uh, plot the an image, of, because we've got the, the, the spatial capabilities, you can plot an image essentially of these trap states here. And this, uh, this is what it looks like. So this is a, a plot of the, of the trap states, so trap clusters in these samples, um, which introduce subgap trap states. Uh, and you can see, first of all, that they, these are small clusters of traps, so they're not sizes of grains, for example. They're sort of on the order of tens of nanometers up to maybe hundreds of nanometers in size. Uh, and we can correlate that with um, a photoluminescence map. Uh, so this is looking at, uh, so in, in blue here, this is the, the, the trap states and the, and the photo emission, uh, so the, the uh, signals related to the photo emission from traps. And the uh, black to yellow color scale is the photoluminescence. You can see quite a strong anti-correlation, particularly in the regions that are, that are really dark and poorly luminescent. You can see lots of these, uh, the, these trap clusters. So we believe these are uh, at least uh, playing a major role in, in the non-relative recombination in, in these films. Uh, and with this technique as well, I, I'll, I'll just show you an example of uh, where we can photo excite the sample and, and, uh, with, with a pulse of light and look at the change in the PEEM signal, the photo emission signal over time, and then that essentially gives us, we can visualize the, the, the trapping in real time. So this is a, at zero picoseconds, an optical pulse is going to come in, and what you're seeing in the dark regions here are the changes associated with, with holes, photo, uh, photo holes trapping in these nanoscale trap clusters. Uh, so it's a very powerful technique to visualize, uh, to, to visualize these traps and to visualize what's happening. Uh, and so to understand more about what these traps are and where they're coming from, we've been correlating these, uh, the, these photo emission maps with uh, again, with structural maps, so this time with nano X-ray diffraction maps, we get down to about 50 nanometer resolution. This is done at Diamond Light Source on the I-14 beamline. 
Uh, and what we find is, so if we look at, this is a, a theme map. So again, the, this is, these are the trap clusters. If we look at a region away from any of these trap states, you can see uh, we can index it to pristine perovskite. That's what we would expect. Uh, and we can see that relatively well across the sample. Uh, but when we look at some of these, the, or when we look at these trap clusters, we see that they're actually associated with other phases in the sample. So this, uh, uh, this one here, for example, corresponds to lead iodide. We expect lead iodide because most of these alloyed samples have an excess of lead iodide in the recipes, so that this is not that unexpected. Uh, but what we don't necessarily expect is small inclusions of, uh, of hexagonal polytype phases. So these are uh, other phases in the perovskite. We don't see these in macroscopic measurements. We're only seeing them on very, very, sm at least in good films, uh, in very, very small quantities on the nanoscale. Uh, these hexagonal polytypes are uh, 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 shown here. These are just some examples. The, the most famous or well-known one is the 2H or delta phase for these former, med former medinium-rich samples. Uh, but there are other types. There's all these linear combinations of corner sharing and edge sharing uh, state uh, 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 structures of 4H and 6H, for example, and there are many, many others as well. Uh, so we, we see that these polytypes in particular are problematic for, for carry trapping. Uh, I'll direct you to, so Sonia is speaking uh, tomorrow from Keshav's group about this and actually how um, she's been able to use the time resolve PIM to understand exactly the, the carrier trapping in these, in these different states. So I'll, I'll refer you to, to her talk uh, for more info. So I've, I've talked a lot about the, uh, the bad uh, and, the, and the traps. So now I'll perhaps onto some of the, some of the good. Uh, and this is looking at the, the chemical variations in these samples and how, at least in the alloyed systems where efficiencies are relatively good, we're seeing perhaps some benefit from the chemical heterogeneity. Uh, so this is some work where we're looking at, uh, this is a nano X-ray fluorescence map of a triple cation halide perovskite sample. Uh, this is the scale bars of micron for reference. Uh, and so this is looking at the bromide content of the sample. Uh, and so Kyle and Miguel have been developing techniques to be able to uh, to look at the quantitative optical properties of these materials in, in the microscope. So this is uh, looking at local photoluminescence quantum efficiency measurements, so actually calibrating it to have an absolute PLQE on the local scale. Uh, and also from this PL spectra, you can extract uh, the OVAC energy as well. So looking at essentially the disorder of the, the, the tail states. Uh, and overlaid in the blue here is the, the highest 20% bromide fraction. And what you can see is that the, the bromine, the higher bromine fractions actually correlate with higher PLQE, typically. So the more emissive regions are bromine rich. And we can see that also if we look at the lowest 20% bromide fraction, where you can see that this tracks with, the, with poor luminescence and, and lower reduced luminescence. So this is uh, suggesting that the high bromine-rich regions are high, have high PLQE. Uh, that's all well and good. But when we look at the PL spectrum here, you can actually see that the high PLQE regions actually have a, a slightly red shoulder. And this is actually more associated with an iodine-rich region. So there's, there's perhaps an apparent contradiction here. Uh, but what we believe is happening is that this, these techniques, the probing the bromide, it, it's a bulk measurement, so we're seeing the bromine through the bulk of the grain. But what we have within this is small, very small iodine-rich inclusions on which carriers funnel onto and recombine uh, with very high relative efficiency. Uh, and I also, I'll refer you to also to Kyle's talk later today, who will be able to talk much more on this and some of the techniques that he's been developing to look at these, uh, look at these measurements. And we've been working with Akshay Rao's group to, to look at transient absorption microscopy of these measurements of these samples. So here we correlate, uh, again, the luminescence. Uh, so this is a, a, a slice across the film, a line slice across the film. We can look at the luminescence and find uh, um, highly emission, emissive regions and very poorly emissive regions, and then look at the transient absorption microscopy. And that's what's shown here, where we look at the ground slate bleach energy, so essentially the energy of recombination of the carriers on these sites. Uh, and this is a, as a function of time after the excitation. And what we see is that in the regions where we have poor luminescence, we don't see any shift in the, in the energy of recombination. This is because it's associated with carrier trapping. But in the regions where it's very luminescent, we see this uh, shift from higher energy to lower energy as the carriers funnel down to lower energy sites. And, what we, and, and this is the, the model of what we're seeing. This is what we think is the, uh, of the energetic landscape of these materials that we have. Uh, carrier traps, which I've talked about, these trap clusters, these nanoscale trap clusters, and that's what leads to the, the low luminescence in those regions. But then we have these slight, from the halide variations, we have these slight band gap variations. And in fact, we have um, lower energy iodine-rich sites and carriers, photoexcited holes in particular, funnel very efficiently onto these. 
and then they accumulate at very high densities, and you get very high radiative recombination. And in fact, this is the, the photodoping I talked about earlier, where we have uh, accumulation of photoexcited holes uh, in these regions. And it, this has an added bonus of actually being able to, it means that as these carriers diffuse around, that many of them will actually end up falling into these funnels and emitting radiatively rather than uh, diffusing and, and randomly finding a trap. Uh, I, I would say that this, of course, is not uh, the ideal. If we, you could, if we could get rid of these traps, that would be the best case because, of course, we pay a little voltage penalty for this shallow funnel, but at least we believe this is why some of these alloy systems are working so well because you get this nice balance between the carrier traps and some of this carrier funneling. Um, okay, so just I'm going to move into now uh, stability and how these trap clusters relate to stability. So we'll, we'll move back to these trap clusters again. And so this is uh, work looking at uh, photo exciting the sample over time and looking at uh, how the sample changes and how the sample uh, undergoes photo degradation. This is over uh, this 120 hours solar illumination equivalent. And looking, this is a spatially average, uh, spatially average measurement now looking at the subgap density of states and how that changes over time. Uh, <coughs> and so what we see is we see a large increase in the subgap state, density of subgap states, and that tracks with uh, uh, a, a big drop in the luminescence uh, in, the, in the PL lifetime. Uh, this is a, a consistent with uh, increased carrier trapping. Uh, <coughs> but what we see is if we, um, if we look locally at these samples, what we see is uh, regions that have lots of carrier traps to start with, so they're very uh, dense in carrier traps, you see a huge increase in the, uh, in, in uh, in the, in the subgap density of states. So we see both <coughs> on a relative scale and on an absolute scale a large increase in the subgap density of states, uh, whereas in the regions that uh, are more pristine, we don't see much change, so very little change. <coughs> what this is saying is that the, the sites that are, are initially have traps and initially uh, have high trap densities are the ones that are degrading. So we're seeing the biggest changes where the traps are initially. And so what we're seeing is actually the, 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 the photo instabilities are seeding at these trap states. And in fact, we can, if we look at this as an SEM image uh, of the degraded samples, so we see pinholes where, where we have photo degradation. And a lot of these, these pinholes are associated, uh, the blue is the PIM or the trap distributions at initially before any photo degradation. We see uh, where we have photo emission or, or trap signals, we see pinholes forming. So this, this means that these trap clusters are, are, are bad news for, uh, for stability. Uh, to understand that in a bit more detail, we've been looking at uh, the zooming in on the structure in a bit more detail, and this is using scanning electron diffraction uh, imaging. And so this is, uh, we, we can use a direct electron detector, so we can go to very low uh, doses, very low electron doses, so well below the, the so, so we're somewhere around six electrons per angstrom squared, so very well below the, uh, the um, degradation threshold for these materials, so we're confident we're not seeing structural changes associated with the beam, at least. Uh, and this is what we can see. So this is a, a diffraction sum image of a, a triple cation sample, in fact. And this is we can see the as we scan across this this grain, you can see the diffraction pattern associated with that. Uh, and this is it's a nice technique because it's very powerful, but it also just shows how again how heterogeneous these films are as we go across this boundary, how much variation there is. Uh, and so to link this back to stability, this is some measurements we're looking at photo excited, uh, we're, we're illuminating over uh, extended periods and seeing the changes. So this is in the same region of the sample. Uh, and we see, I don't know if you can see it very well, sorry if you can't see it very well on the screen, but the, most, of the region, most of the sample doesn't change very much, but you see some regions that are changing. You can see a few black specks appearing. Uh, this is metallic lead. We can assign that to metallic lead, which is typically associated with photo degradation. Uh, but we can zoom in on the regions that do change, so these, these two boxes here, so starting with that black one, uh, and we can in index the perovskite. So this is looking at, this is the perovskite grain, which we can index to the pristine perovskite. Uh, and then we can also index th these grains around, and actually shaded in yellow there. These are actually the, the 2H hexagonal polytype phases uh, in the sample. Uh, and as we photo, uh, as we illuminate over time, we see that the uh, material loss and lead zero form, the metallic lead formings, is, is uh, directly associated with these polytype phases. So the perovskite grain itself is actually largely unchanged, but, the, but the, uh, the, these regions here are where the degradation is happening. So again, this is linking to these trap clusters where we see these other phase, unwanted phases, that's where the degradation is happening. 
Uh, and if we, we can also see that with lead iodide. So this is looking at a um, similar thing with lead iodide. This is actually quite interesting. This is an epitaxial lead iodide grain uh, w w with the perovskite. And again, as we illuminate over time, you see that the degradation occurs at the lead iodide, not at the perovskite. And again, you see material loss and, uh, and the metallic lead forming. Uh, and finally, this is uh, a slightly more complicated junction. So here, again, we have a, an impurity phase sitting at the junction between two perovskite grains here. Uh, and again, we see the photodegradation happens at, at the site where this impurity is, this phase impurity. Uh, but what we see actually in this one is that the perovskite grain itself also starts to be eaten away. So it starts at this, at, at the at the, at this impurity phase, but then it starts to creep out into the perovskite grain as well. So again, it, it's consistent with this seeding or, or catalyzing this degradation, these degradation processes. Uh, but what this means is that these residual phase deformities do matter, that even though they're sort of there on very nanoscopic length scales, that they do, in the end, uh, lead to degradation of the film. So they do need to be uh, removed. Uh, so ju just to put together a, a model of what we're seeing and, and of, of, of this, these degradation processes and why the pinholes form. Uh, so if we have this, these phase impurities sitting at the boundary, these are, these are hole traps, so we have a, a, a huge excess of, uh, of, of likely iodine interstitials, although this is still to be confirmed what the actual defect is within them. Uh, but we do see hole trapping at these sites that we believe is associated with, with, with iodine interstitials. This, the hole trapping process converts that to atomic iodine, which then leaves as, as uh, then combines to form molecular iodine, which leaves the system starting uh, kicking off the material loss process. At the same time, we have photoexcited electrons reducing lead 2 plus to lead 0 as well to form the metallic lead. And so the net, pro net effect is you start to see these pinholes forming and have residual lead 0 there as well. OK, so in the, the last two parts, I'm going to talk first about the, wh why, why these phase impurities are there, why we're seeing them, what's causing them, and then move into um, to finish with some of the device work. Uh, and so I, again, I'm going to refer you to Tiernan's talk. He'll be speaking later today on some of this in more depth, and I'll just highlight some of the, uh, a few things here to, to, to direct you there. Uh, first of all, this is looking at what the structure is of these former medium rich samples. And what we see is actually the structure, it's widely thought to be cubic, we actually see it's tetragonal. There's a slight octahedral tilt that in, in these samples. And we see that because if we look at, uh, if we use the scanning electron diffraction, it's actually a very good technique because we can, we can look at different zone axes and actually get uh, a more definitive understanding of what the space group is of the sample by moving across the sample and looking at different uh, zone axes, for example. So th this is a looking at the 001 of the cubic uh, zone axis. And what we see is we see these superstructure peaks here, uh, which, is, which are uh, associated with symmetry breaking. So it's not, this would be inconsistent with the cubic uh, crystal structure. If we look at the 110 uh, zone axis, we don't see these superstructure peaks. So that, those two information, those bits combined, tell us that this must be a, a tetragonal phase uh, with this slight octahedral tilt. So we have this, this is sort of the picture of this P4 MVM uh, space group is what we see. Uh, and we think, and we believe this is because the, the, these other alloy cations, the cesium, the MA, and the MA are inducing this, this slight tilt in the sample. And the reason this is important is because when we look at, and this is some work by Aaron Walsh uh, and his team, when we look at the conversion from the perovskite phase to hexagonal phases, it, it, see it's very different if it starts off as cubic or if it starts off as tetragonal. So if we start off as cubic, what we see is that there's a very low activation energy, uh, activation barrier to convert to these hexagonal polytype phases. And so this can readily happen. But if the structure is tetragonal, uh, then, then there's a much larger barrier. Uh, you can see on the blue on the right there, there's a much larger barrier to this conversion to this tetragonal phase. And so that tells us that these uh, these systems, these former medium rich systems, are actually uh, slightly tilted, and that's what's actually leading to good stability in these samples. Uh, the introduction of cesium, introduction of MA is, is causing this tilt and causing this, this phase stability. Uh, but what that means is we need, f this tilt needs to be completely uniform and, and hom homogeneous everywhere. But if we look at the, the local structure, uh, the local sample again, so these are highlighting hexagonal polytypes in yellow here. And if we look at the, uh, the FA distribution, so it's cut off on the end a little bit, if you look at the former medinium, uh, or, or at least the organics across the sample, uh, you can see that there's little hot spots where you see increased FA, so increased former medinium. And so we believe that this is, because we have, these are very former medinium rich, they're most likely to be cubic, 
And so these are very readily will convert to these hexagonal polytypes. And we think that this is why we're seeing these little small inclusions, because we have regions that we don't have cesium or we don't have MA that's able to impart doctahedral tilt. Uh, and so that, that, that means this is very important um, ramifications for manufacturing. It means we do have to have a very, very uniform uh, chemistry of the A site cation as well, and perhaps much more uniform than we first thought. Uh, and just as one example, so and, and I should also say that we, we've measured a lot of the form MDM rich samples, a lot of the recent um, very high performing fa FAPI samples that actually do have some MA and cesium, all of them do typically, and they also do have the tilt as well. So we're seeing a lot of these samples that recently have been shown to be very stable actually have this octahedral tilt in them as well. This is an example where we've actually been able to do this without any of the cesium or MA. This is pure form of indenomate iodide, but we add EDTA to the precursor solution. And this actually we've, it t templates growth of a very nicely t uh, tilted structure. And so this is, we can see the, the tilt again from the superstructure uh, peaks here. And this leads to very, very phase stable films. So if we look at, this is, uh, if we, if we have pure form of indenomate iodide without any additives, it very, very quickly transforms. This is within minutes to this hexagonal phase and, and turns yellow, and many of you who work with these systems will, will know that. Uh, but when we have this octahedral tilt stabilized system with the EDTA, we see much more stable uh, structure. And in fact, this is a film left out in ambient air for a thousand hours, and you see no formation of the delta phase. So it's a very, very stable form of indenomate iodide film uh, that's induced from uh, having this tilt. Uh, to summarize what we, what we see from these formone enriched samples, so we see uh, the deep, these deep hole trap clusters lead to power losses and seed degradation, and it's because they, they lead to very high, uh, very high trap densities in these local regions. Uh, it, the A-site cations looks like that. Uh, that dictates the local phase impurity distributions. Uh, the X-site influences energy landscape when I showed you this carrier funneling, uh, but it does also influence uh, the phase impurities, it's something we're still trying to understand how the halides also influence this, this phase. But the take home is that we need to induce this octahedral tilt, uh, and ideally not with mixed A-site cations, because it's very difficult to get that to be spatially uniform. Uh, so these templating agents for tilted structures plus other passivation will be very important to prevent them from forming, but also to mitigate them if they do form in the first place. Um, I'm just going to, I know I'm running out of time, so I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to skip over this one and just show uh, this before I finish. Uh, so we've also been looking at multi-source uh, vapor deposition of these films, of these FA-rich films, so particularly FA-cesium rich films, and I'll direct you to Yushien's talk uh, tomorrow, he'll talk more about this. He's been really leading this work, him and Miguel have been leading this work on vapor de deposition of these materials, and we're getting some really quite nice efficiencies in single junctions, 20.7% uh, and really quite stable as well. Uh, and we've also been making all perovskite tandems, and this is a, a really nice result Yushien's got where we're, we're evaporating the wide gap perovskite film in, in a perovskite perovskite tandem, and then we have some interlayers, and then we have the, the low gap perovskite, which is actually which is a solution process. So you get some really nice, uh, nice stacks here, and he's getting very good efficiencies at 24.1%. Uh, we think this is actually mainly limited by the current. We're still uh, a bit down on what the current could be, uh, and that's in particular from the thickness of the low gap absorber. But there's some really good promise there. Uh, and finally, I, I want to highlight something that, uh, that Alan's been working on looking at uh, light coupling in tandems, and this is actually a very important effect that is, will be present in any high-performing tandem that, has, uh, that is luminescent. And this is where we have to consider the, uh, the light coupling from the, uh, from the wide gap cell to the low gap cell, because we have a mission that can be reabsorbed by the, the low gap cell. And in fact, that actually leads to, it relaxes the current matching and material requirements. So if we look at the uh, the optimum efficiency with the high band gap and low band gap cell, you can see there's somewhere around 1.75, 1.8 EV for the perovskite tandem when we have a 1.2 EV low gap absorber. But when we include light coupling in the modeling, uh, this broadens a lot, and uh, we see that, in fact, you can go to much lower band gaps, so more like 1.6 or 1.65 EV can be as efficient as the much larger band gaps. Uh, so this means we don't necessarily have to be looking at the, more, the less stable very wide band gaps. We can be looking at less than 1.7 EV. Uh, Pablo's lurking, so I'm going to wrap up. Uh, just to summarize here that we see these nanoscale trap clusters are problematic uh, for performance and reliability, and some of these multimodal techniques have been very useful in understanding a lot of this nanoscale work. So thank you to uh, my group and funders and, and collaborators who contributed to this work, and thank you again for the opportunity. <laughs>